business consultant and a Harvard professor coined the term disruptive innovation. But I personally believe that disruption has been part of our uh, human civilization from the beginning. Right? Uh, let me go back uh, and talk to you about some of those things that happened. The controlled use of fire. Do you know this happened even before the modern human age? Invention of wheel. When did that happen? 3500 years BC that gave wheels to the human being. Now let's go to the recent past. Uh, talking of uh, light bulb, that was a big disruption. Would you like to add some more, some of the thoughts from your side? What do you think were the disruptive innovations that happened in the human civilization? Telephone. 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 Exactly. Blu-ray. Yeah. Then uh, cell phones. So these are some of the examples of the disruptive things that not happened long before, I mean, like recently. And as we speak, we are talking about um, chat GPT, BART, yeah, and uh, we are talking about 5G and 6G enabled connected world through Internet of Things and cyborgs. So life is getting very exciting, the world is getting very interesting, isn't it, guys? And today's panel that we have, I must say, uh, these three gentlemen, uh, these are, they, they have the, they've had their own share of contribution with their own disruptive ideas and the steps they take in their journey of enterprise, being entrepreneurial and directorial in your case, I would say. So wonderful, let me get right into the conversation, starting, uh, so I have all three of you giving your views on it. My first question is that in your journey, what was that one disruptive step you took, or steps you took, more than one also, which paved the way for, to success for all of you individually? And which changed your life. So maybe I'll start with you. You're okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll talk. I'll talk about the disruptive idea which helped us start this uh, company, publishing company. Uh, so uh, grooming, men's grooming was not a uh, was not an accepted market or not. Uh, in, it was in its initial days, there were not many brands. And uh, whatever happened in male grooming was something which was repackaged as uh, a Nivea men or a Pons men or a Kanye men, uh, which was rebranded as something for men. Uh, uh, when there were deodorants like Fog, which was reinvented and challenging the big players like Axe. But there was one uh, company in shaving which was an incoming player and there were not many takers globally uh, who would stand against them. One, because they had a patent and their economies of scale and two, the scale and the brand they built, which was synonym like a Xerox as to the process of photocopying, Gillette was to shave it. So that idea of challenging uh, Gillette in its game and doing that in India and building a brand which is Indian and which would could could be global uh, was the disruptive idea which really changed the game for me and still is going and uh, uh, that is and it's not an easy game which is like a uh, good, uh, good number of decades to reach there and we are we are reducing that uh, number of years to reach there and be there. Wonderful, uh, very interesting plan, ready to make, to make. I'm really ready to ask you more questions on that, but we'll come back to you. Before that, uh, we'll go to Sahil, and Sahil, what's that big idea? So, you know, I have two uh, phases in my life which have really shaped me, and they have a disruptive uh, nature to them. So, when I was 17, I dropped out of college. Well, that's the thing to do for an right? Uh, this is in Los Angeles, I dropped out, I was very interested in the media world. So, and this is 2003, 4, 5, YouTube is yet to be born and take off. So, you have produced a lot of content. So, you know, producing content was always sold to TV channels as bites or seconds. That was the whole business model. 
but we try to produce that segment, uh, the video segment and sell them as DVDs or to these channels for their upcoming online sites. So I think you are early to the game and a big thing in entrepreneurship is of timing, right? We often miss time our innovations. But that at least, you know, gave me my mindset for future businesses. That how you innovate, you don't need to follow a particular system. You need to find how you can reinvent the market or create your own market. That kind of got me off this journey. And most recently, what we're doing now is something called Rudy's Coffee House. So, which is, you know, I, I have a fun background. So, we were associated with a lot of restaurants, which are former coffee shops or, or um, formal coffee shops uh, or American diners. But what we want to do is create a whole new segment where it's a high energy coffee shop. Whenever you think of coffee shops, you go to, you think of, you know, co working space, something very pleasant, pastels, greenery. So, which is great. We all love that. But where is this high energy coffee shop? You want to have fun and it's, a, it's almost like a bar, but you're being served coffee. So we kind of created this very disruptive uh, restaurant segment and you know, we've been able to scale to 10 restaurants in a year because we've found, we created our own market. So I think disruption for me is often creating the very market that it existed. It kind of makes a competition which is here that you compete with yourself. So those are the two main uh, things that Super. So we would like to flesh out that a little more in the second round. Yeah. Okay, uh, so ca coming to a point. So in my case, I joined the legacy business like audit taxation, investment banking, and do financial services. But when I joined in 2012, I saw the scope of digital transformation, where uh, I came into KPU and start building and working on the KPU thing. And now it has grown to 100 people, and then it's growing a little bit. But yeah, that was a time there where the implementation of digitization has to happen. So I joined the thing. Just according to my disruptive idea, it's not a complex idea, maybe AI, machine learning, and everything. But it can be a simple idea. It may be a make or break habit, or it can be as simple as like uh, following the trend but uh, different way in a different way. So it is not uh, like you have to be. Uh, doing AI or fancy stuff to be part of disruptive idea. Absolutely. You just talked about the examples of you know the old time stone age rather. Thank you. Um, so while normally you know you would associate disruptive ideas with um, you know more of the entrepreneurial journeys or startups, uh, I would like to share a very interesting um, I don't know whether to refer it into the same category, but something that we did uh, which was completely a new and a new way of uh, you know thinking I would say we brought into our business. So as an organization I am working with Vodafone Idea and uh, we f really are an organization who is for building diversity and inclusivity in the culture and in every domain you know largely you would see the organizations there are a lot of organizations who pursue that and they tend to get uh, female employees uh, whether in the back end or in HR, you would largely see that's where you will have more female professionals. But we as an organization really wanted to get females in the sales force. We wanted our distributors to also employ female, uh, you know, DS sales uh, advisors, you can say. But we were facing a huge challenge. And, uh, and we didn't know how to solve that. We would recruit more and more females. Uh, they would come and make promises and after some time they would just disappear and they would not come back to work. Uh, and we didn't know what to do with that. So I was a female uh, leader, uh, so I was given a task to understand what exactly is happening because you know, as a woman to woman you can understand why are these women going. And I spoke to some of them and you wouldn't believe the things that they said. They said, you know what, we, we, we go to the markets dehydrated. Because when we go to the market and we have to cover the market whole day going from one distributor to another distributor in the sun and if we drink a lot of water, we don't have decent hygienic places to relieve ourselves. And you know, it, we don't feel safe, you know, while the sales guys along with us can just, you know, uh, use any, uh, you know, washrooms and whatever is available for women, it is not really hygienic for them to, uh, or safe for them to use any public toilets. So that was quite an alarming thing which as a person who was operating from a boardroom and her own cabin, unfathomable. And it was really heartbreaking too. 
So we were looking for reasons elsewhere and look what is the kind of reason we found. So that's when in the organization we started the project in the name of Project Comfort. A drive in which we made sure and we mandated that all our distributors, wherever in the market they are, they ensure there is a washroom which, is, which has a latch, which is cleaned and maintained on a daily basis and it remains locked. It's not used for just people from wherever and when the female staff really needs to use it, they have it available. That's one drive we did. Then later we also found that you know, for our own sales girls who were going in the market, they did not know where the washrooms are and what sort of places are there. So we, on the Google map, we marked and mapped all the washrooms which were decent, which were, uh, you know, we had feedback that they are maintained well. There are some restaurants in the market which come in the speed of a sales person so that they can stop over there and use those. We spoke to those restaurants to allow our employees, female employees to use their uh, washrooms and we mapped each one of those on the Google Maps uh, link. So that when I'm planning my beach for market today, I know that, you know, maybe in two hours time, if I go towards that market or in that shop, there is a restroom available to me. And that really helped us grow the number of female employees in the sales force. We started with, I think, 9%, we are today at 16%. And I am really hoping that we go for this. So, so I think these are some of the things, uh, you know, that come with knowing the reality, challenging your thought process and challenging yourself and your beliefs. That is perhaps one way of bringing in some disruptive ideas. But that's my question I often wonder. Why there are very few minds? Like, the more you chase it, the more it, uh, the, it's a mirage that further goes away. So you just have to be in a mindset where you need to find what you're really good at and what industry, what sector you can really deep dive into. And yes, you do use a lot of cross uh, collaboration and experience. So let's say I worked in media, like the example I gave. That uh, exposure of working in an industry and finding that niche now makes me think in a different way. So the more things you experiment with, you are less reverse, uh, risk averse. And the sooner you start doing it, there is no age. Then the older you get, kind of take lesser and lesser risk. So the more you put yourself out there and the more things you learn, you can apply them and it kind of changes your brain chemistry. You can't see a simple thing like a bottle and not wonder what can be done differently, what could have been more interesting. So it kind of changes your mindset. Okay, uh, I think I'll go to a good one. I'm just <laughs> So, according to me, it depends on the individual and the upbringing as well, and the city, the friends. So, if a person has grown in an industry uh, or industrial uh, city that's like Jamshedpur, so they will be more inclined towards manufacturing. If they have been born in water management, or they might have been into more IT. So, people find their way. If, if someone is curious enough to disrupt something traditional business, they he might do in Jamshedpur as well as then Bangalore. So it depends on the individual. I think that's a very interesting question. And I maybe think a little uh, and I think one thing which drives me uh, to uh, drive innovation is the competitive mindset. I think uh, we have this generation of uh, 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 who get this engineer uh, uh, IT is there in the your film uh MD, you know uh, I, I am and all this. So you never, you're always on this race of winning, winning. And there's also a balance to reach after a certain age where you're also self aware uh, of what you can do and what you should uh, uh, be also self aware that uh, not be so confident that you are easily okay with what you have achieved, but even push yourself further to uh, uh, do something which others have not done before. And that filter, whatever you do, uh, in every new launches, in every way you're communicating, the way you're dealing with problems, if it was there erstwhile in a different, in, in, a, in a way you challenge that, uh, even in your home's behavior, like if dad is telling me to do something, I would question why he telling me. So questioning the analytical mind and the uh, thing to beat, uh, to win, Competitive, uh, the competitive mindset is, I think, the private for money. Uh, Wonderful. Now, some really good thoughts there. Uh, so, I'm staying with you. Uh, I come back to, uh, you know, what I said in the beginning that male grooming is a very 
you know, it's an industry which, while it looks, there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of vacuum, because it's not in comparison to the counterpart industry of female uh, grooming and, you know, a lot of, um, there's a lot happening there. So was it a risk, you know, really stepping into it? And what was your thought behind it? Like, why did you think that was the right, uh, you know, segment to get into and put your mind behind it? So, FMCG has always been the uh, uh, most sought after segment in the product industry for an MBA because that's where you learn most about consumers, which was the field of interest. Coming to male grooming, I uh, uh, I had uh, an interest for it myself, uh, uh, being in boarding school, grooming myself. Uh, I, I went to a boarding school when I was at the age of five. So what did I, I learned to tie my own shoelaces at the age of five and I learned to you know, wear a tie, put a tie in the double knot and the single knot and eat with a spoon and fork. So grooming was part of my upbringing. So uh, I, I, and I, uh, there was a difference, well, as you said, women enjoyed their five minutes, ten minutes of grooming and stepping out, have, having a good hair day which gives them a good confidence and <laughs> yes, so it, it's good, bad, and, and you really immerse yourself in the, in the process of taking care of yourself. Why for men, if it's a Sunday, you don't groom. So grooming was Monday, like it became boring. Uh, if it's a wedding, if it's something special, you will work for it. If it's a normal day, if you're then you don't groom yourself. Uh, you are forced to shave if you're in a certain industry going to work. So how do you make that enjoy? And uh, that was the uh, that was the industry we were getting into. But we were also on the brink of change, digitalization, uh, uh, women uh, rising in society. You know, getting more educated, getting more jobs, and even marriages uh, where women were having equal part in choosing their partner than men were. So uh, it, the responsibility before matrimonials led like wanted a tall, fair, good looking wife and uh, everyone wanted that and women had so much pressure for looking good. So the society was such that the pressure was all on women to take care of themselves but men had no pressure. But as you saw the digitalization, people swiping left right, like you are putting selfies. Uh, if, even a guy has a certain responsibility, pressure or validation which they need from women to look good. So, you could take it that way or, or, or also grooming themselves also help them feel good about themselves. So uh, we were reaching that equality stage where men were also uh, compared to them. Okay, interesting. Are you spoiling them? Just showing them something that they had never thought of all this while. If they enjoy the process. Are, are makeups also on the way? So, they are. They are on a lighter note. So, uh, for the Bombay Shaving co founder, uh, today not shaving, uh, is it because it's a Sunday? <laughs> so, or you don't want to be the role model or have your own way? So, when you want to shave, you have an option. When you don't want to shave, maintain your beard also. So, as long as you can get up to sleep. As long as you So previously it was it was made to believe if you shave you get a good wife. If you shave you have no money. If you don't shave then but uh, why we uh, take care of shaving we also take care of beard. Good. Thank you. Uh, now Sahil, um, you know your journey is very very interesting and the business that you have you're in. It's it's a it's a business where I think everybody wants to get into. It's a space. You know, you would see cafes opening every day, bars opening every day, restaurants opening every day, um, and and shopping also. You know, you would go to a place, especially Chandigarh. Every time I come from Bombay, I go to a place. So there was this cafe here. What happened to that? This got shut. There's another one which is open. So it's 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 a very uh, it's a very volatile. It's a very unstable and not very uh, promising when it comes to longevity kind of an industry. You know, I think because everybody wants to try his or her hands. What makes you and um, and Rodi's Cafe House, Coffee House stand apart? 
So rightly said, I think uh, you know, it's very low barrier to entry and, and everybody thinks they can cook well and everybody has somebody at home who cooks very well and they're like, oh, you should be a restaurant girl, right? Because you cook very well. And I think so when I went to NCR is where I really deep dive and it took us, so I ran a restaurant in Toronto in 2008 and that was after I sold my startup and uh, the media startup. So I thought, you know what best to do, because to come into a little bit of money, like I want to run my own bar. I already have friends, they all free. <laughs> and of course, what do we have? They have a great beer and pick that's a restaurant, we are done, we are billionaire now. Right? But when you actually get into a restaurant, like setting up a small cottage industry, right? From uh, the very base, and it all boils down, I mean, things people know, but it boils down to cash flow management. Like, what is your business model? And people don't understand that running a business and cooking well are two different things. Right? Cooking well is a hobby or it's a passion, it's a talent. By running a business, right? What is the construction cost? What is your cash flow? What is your operating cash flow? What are your working capital requirements? How do you, you so you know a lot of restaurants will see they're full, but they still close down. Why? But even their capacity, even when they're full and their average food price doesn't cover up the total expenses. Yeah. Most people don't understand what a fixed cost and a variable. The very basic of finances, people just jump into it. And I always say, Restaurants, I think, were the startups, what startups are now. Restaurants were the startups of the 80s or the 70s, I think. But everybody wants to get into it, and there's a lot of funding going around, some some are really big hits. But I think people have learned there's a lot of industry education, there's a lot of there's a lot of organization consolidation around. People have easy access to knowledge. So that's why you also see people being able to scale now, right? People understand what is a niche restaurant or the scalable restaurant. So when we decided to do Rodi's Puppy House, first we can kind of market. Analysis of it's a very easy market. There is no dirt of coffee. But uh, what we chose is specialty coffee, which is, you know, the most simplest of words in our Punjab audience is it's a uh, single malt versus your blended coffee, right? So, uh, blended business. So, we, we picked the more highest uh, end coffee and we said, how do we democratize it? How do we make it easy? How do we make it easy for a regular person to understand what is a light roast, a complex roast? Uh, what is an Arabica bean or a Robusta bean? Ultimately, an Indian only wants strong coffee or I do only two things I want to be worried about. Right? So we're trying to kind of take in all the bonus of the complexity of coffee from sourcing and making specialty coffee very accessible and very good prices. So you know we did a lot of value innovation of taking an expensive product, making it at a, a very affordable price. And then most coffee shops, like most restaurants, when you specialize in one product, so let's say you take up a three lakh, four lakh market in those days. Now you want to run a restaurant, but you're selling coffee. Like what happens at 9 p.m., right? Who is in a such sector in Chandigarh at 9 p.m. drinking coffee? Maybe 3 people, right? So you have to optimize it. Does it make sense for the business to pick up that property? So that's why we added a lot of food. So we have a food forward plan. So we took the American diner concept and we added a lot of food. And then we added that we run our restaurants 24 7. So that's a completely different market. Yeah. Nobody knew that our restaurant in Mohali. It's nuts. If you go there on a Saturday night, you don't even realize where these people come from. Right? These are people who now are hungry at 2 a.m. Right? They have decided to have massive dinner parties at 3 a.m. So, you know, I think that, that brings in the aspect of creating a new market, adding a new market. You know, that is how we kind of put a few things together. And, uh, That's awesome. Okay, so um, coming to Apurva, you know, these days, um, you know, we have this huge idea of working in the organization, which is like incremental, trade improvement philosophy that Follow. There's also this concept that we follow fail fast. So do you think this has some connection with you know bringing in this kind of taking the risk and starting your ventures and you know, perhaps reviewing it quickly and seeing whether you want to make it or not make it? So are they connected? Exactly, I don't know, but uh, what I think is uh, they may be. Uh, uh, what it means, like uh, when I did start with the digital transformation, I was not uh, known that whether I will be able to serve from Chandigarh or not. It may uh, have been very difficult time because they might not. Uh, that time there were no fiber nets, uh, untrained employees, and everyone. So we started training them in house training, giving them lectures on the weekends, and then having all sorts of infrastructure development which we could do in that time. We have our own ancient group like that. Okay. And what about you? Sure, so I totally believe in that so I I personally invite that a lot that uh, you know fail fast is the right answer. 
A lot of people spend a lot of time on Excel sheets and in theory, conceptualizing an idea. Ideas are things, but ideas are time and other. And the one who executes takes them. Yeah. Right? So we all come up with 10 different, especially in the startup world, we all have some innovative idea that nobody has thought of. But everybody, a lot of people have. So I think the best way is to like not worry about it and build towards what you call an MVP, right? the minimum viable product. That is the end goal you want to experiment, uh, change your business model, try a lot of different things and achieve something that uh, you can then call like a viable product. I think that I'm sure that when your journey also, you know, that's how you reach the product market fit as I call it. So uh, uh, we uh, we always encourage people to fail, and it, I, but as we grow, failing becomes expensive. So uh, when we fail, it's also our responsibility to learn and add that to the learning process. So we don't really the we every time we try something. New. So uh, a lot of learning, and uh, not just internally but externally on what works, and then. Okay, one okay. Um, so if they, these two guys could have come to you 10 years back telling that he wants to get into Bombay shaving uh, company and uh, wants to get into male grooming and he wanted to set up a cafe with a difference, would you have financed them being the financial reason? I don't think so. That <laughs> banks and financial institutions doesn't support your startups. But now the people are coming forward, everyone want to do crowd, part, be part of crowdfunding. They want to be part of the tech and uh, startups. So now the ease of uh, finance is more easy than that time, I think, when you guys started. I think you must want to found your struggle ways to raise the capital. I think technology was a big barrier. Uh, one of the barriers to entry was your, the only way of distribution was keeping a lot of inventory across penetration all villages and cities in India. So that was a lot of work here. Then having, building a brand, which was not through consumer driven but go through paying big celebrities, putting them on TV, big media spends. Today, if you have to launch a brand, I can leave the consumer directly through me, through my own page, through Instagram, through a lot of different channels, which is less cost to my brand. I don't need a brand ambassador. I, I can educate on the product. I can do, uh, offer different things and I can reach straight to consumer. So unit economics is also making sense. So, uh, and uh, building a brand, uh, uh, there were not many uh, homegrown Indian brands. And today's generation, we want to build more new brands. We have more stories to tell. We understand the consumers in a more one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one basis. And it's not a foreign brand which is building a brand in India, which is Indianization or uh, globalization of that brand in India. So even the biggest of campaigns which are celebrated are American or European concepts which are rebranded in Indian context. But building our own stories and telling them and eventually creating a brand, a good story which which appeals to our own consumers by understanding them is what we